I'm going to start off with a top level directory structure, which I'm calling branch two Kubernetes HA cluster. You can, of course, call it anything you want. This is going to contain our subdirectories, which is going to be Ansible, Terraform, and Rancher 2. So, all the configs that we create throughout this tutorial series will go into one of those three directories. And to get started with Terraform, all we need is one file, the main.tf file. So, we'll go ahead and touch that file to create it. And then I'm going to edit this project inside VS Code, which I've found to be a really useful and decent editor for pretty much anything that's not PHP at the moment. So that's what I'm rocking. As a side note, one of my favorite features of VS Code is the open workspace mode. So you can, if you don't like putting your directory structure as we've just done with one top level directory and then subdirectories, you can have all of these as high level directories effectively like root level and then create them all inside one workspace. So it's another way of doing it. To get some nice auto completion inside VS Code, I'm going to install the Terraform plugin. Now I've just chosen this ad hoc. I don't have a recommendation on that or whichever to choose, just choose one and they're all pretty good, I guess. Hopefully you're somewhat aware of what Terraform as a tool can do for you. We're using it strictly sort of in the web sense where we want to provision virtual servers somewhere in the cloud. But as you can see, it can be used for other purposes as well. We're going to be using DigitalOcean for the rest of this tutorial series, one of the easier cloud providers to set up with Terraform in my opinion. It's worth pointing out that DigitalOcean have their own managed Kubernetes option. I've never used it, but I'm aware of it and it works out a lot cheaper than doing it this way. And whilst that does sound like I'm badmouthing my own tutorial, the truth is that you should know of the other option and you should be pragmatic about which one that you use. The way that Terraform transforms our configuration into working infrastructure is through, in this case, DigitalOcean's API. And to use DigitalOcean's API, we need an API token. Notice that I said we need certain arguments are required. So in this case, for DigitalOcean to be able to be used, we have to provide a token. You've got to check the docs for each of the different providers and stuff that you use. It's not the end of the world, but of course it is a little bit of a chore. This is a good example of why I've installed the Terraform plugin is because it catches syntax irregularities and mistakes basically that I've made along the way. Because we don't want to hard code our API token inside this main.tf file, we're going to inject it. And there's various ways that you can do that, including setting them via command line arguments, getting them from environment variables. Well, the way that we're going to do it is to use a separate file, which kind of raises the question, well, aren't we just going to commit that file as well? It just kind of negates what we've just done. The one such solution to this would be to use secrets and how you do that is entirely dependent on your environment and it's outside of the scope of this tutorial, but that is one way that you can get around this. Okay, so at this point we can start defining our infrastructure. The way that we do that is to use resources. A resource is probably the most common of all the top level keys that you will use. If your experience with Terraform is anything like mine anyway, each of the different providers will give you different resources. And again, you can find a full list of these on the documentation. Much like how token was a required key when we specified the provider of DigitalOcean, each of the individual resources will also have some keys that are required. In this case, it's just the name of the droplet that we want to create. And then we're going to provide some specifics as well. So which image that's available at DigitalOcean are we going to use? What's the size of the droplet? In what region do we want to put it? And this, of course, raises the question that where on earth do you get these values from? Well, some providers like DigitalOcean are pretty good actually at publishing them. Other providers, not so much. If the information's not directly available, you can get it from the API. That's where these values are coming from anyway. How you get access to the API is specific to your different provider. Hopefully though, the information is just a Google search away. Now this next section is really interesting because to get access to our new server, we're gonna to want to have root login essentially. So we want to type in SSH root at and then some IP address. That's also an interesting challenge. And ideally we should be able to log in without having to provide a password. Now you may be aware that this is possible if you're using DigitalOcean's web front end. And the process that we need to do kind of mimics that. So the process from DigitalOcean's point of view, if you log in using their control panel, is that you would first upload a copy of the contents of your ID rsa.pub public SSH key. And so when you go to provision a droplet, you can say, oh, by the way, please will you also set this as an authorized key entry for the root user in the resulting droplet. What I'm doing here is using Terraform's file function to look for a path on my local disk. 
and reading the contents of that file and store it as in this case our public key. Now this approach wouldn't scale if there was multiple people in a team. In that case you would probably look at the TFRs file as we will do shortly. And so by defining a resource I can then reference that resource in another resource and Terraform will take care of the fact that the key must be available before we can create our droplet. That's pretty much all the configuration we need at this point so let's go ahead and use the Terraform command. Now in order to do this I'm going to use docker. This means I don't need to install anything aside from docker on my local machine. I'm going to try and follow this principle throughout the rest of this tutorial. But just as a heads up if you want to you can install and run all these commands locally as well. I'm well aware that to the uninitiated docker commands particularly from the command line look really long winded and horrible. So I'm going to use the slash to break up each line which I think makes it a little bit easier to read. So we start off with docker run dash dash rm. That means at the end of the execution of our container, that container will be removed. In other words, we won't have to clean up after ourselves. We'll need to use a volume. That's the dash v. I'm going to set the volume to map between our local current working directory. That's the pwd to inside the container, the path of go source github.com hashicorp terraform. In other words, what's in our current working directory when the container runs to the container, it will be seen as if it was at that path. And the way that we ensure that is that we pass in the working directory flag and we tell it to ensure that it runs from this directory. We need to give the docker image name and the tag. In this case, I'm specifying HashiCorp's Terraform image with the 0.11.11 .11 tag. This should be the latest at the time of recording. Check Docker Hub to see what's the latest when you're doing this tutorial for yourself. By default, this image runs the command terraform. So that means we can just immediately pass in dash dash version. So effectively, if we was running this from our local machine, it would be terraform dash dash version, which you should expect to see the version of the executable output to the screen, which is exactly what we get. We have quite a lot of noise from the Docker download. So if we rerun the command this time, we should see just the version. Now seeing the version is useful, but the real command that we need is the init command. So we need to change our dash dash version to init. And when we run that command, Terraform is going to look at our main.tf file, which is going to be available to the container because we set up that volume mapping. It's going to look inside our main.tf file and see that we've configured a provider of DigitalOcean. And it's going to go ahead and try and download a DigitalOcean provider plugin for us. Now DigitalOcean is one of the supported providers out of the box. So this process is pretty painless but if you've got an unsupported provider you can still work around this with third party plugins it's just more involved. In short when we run the terraform init command behind the scenes a hidden local directory is going to be created called .terraform and into there any files that terraform needs to work with our particular chosen provider are going to be stored. Next I'm going to create a make file and I'm going to use that to allow me to create aliases for some of the longer winded commands that we're going to have to type in. One example of this is the docker run command that we've had to type in to enable us to run terraform and there will be plenty more as we go through the rest of this tutorial. Now if you've never used a make file before then they can seem a little bit scary to begin with or at least that's how I felt. Honestly the way I use them is perhaps not super how they were intended but it works really well. As I said, we'd kind of just create an alias, which would then allow us just to run, in this case, make terraform, and then it's going to run that long-winded command for us. Now there are some interesting things about make files, which I will make you aware of, no pun intended. The first is that they're really tab dependent. As you can see, the docker run command is indented with one tab. And then just for my convention, I like to nest anything below in another tab. I can do that because I've used the slash as a line continuation. Now I've defined one target here, the target of Terraform. And by default, all make file targets are file targets. They're used to build files from other files. As I say, we're using make kind of outside the way that it's originally intended to be used. So because Terraform isn't actually a real target, we need to explicitly mark this target as phony to ensure make doesn't get confused. Pretty much whenever you define a new target, just make sure that you mark it as phony. The last tip that I have is that you may want to prefix your commands with an at and that would suppress the full command from getting written out to the terminal whenever you run this. So for example, make terraform. In our case, without the at symbol, it's going to spit the entire docker run dash dash etc etc all of that out to your terminal. But if you put the at sign before docker run, 
then it won't do that. It'll sort of hide that. A really interesting thing about when we run this docker run command against the HashiCorp Terraform image is that the resulting container is going to run the Terraform binary. And the Terraform binary contains loads of subcommands that we can run. And we don't really want to limit ourselves to just running the init command as we have done previously. So make files can take variables from the command line. So when we run this command, what we can do is we can say make Terraform and then command equals something. So in our case, we might be like, command equals init or command equals apply or command equals destroy. But as a sneaky little gotcha, because we copied this command directly from the command line, we can't use command line style things such as pwd. We have to use the make file equivalent, which is cur dir or current dir. So let's give this a shot now by jumping over to our terminal and running make terraform with the command of init. Even though we've already run the init command, we can rerun it. And note that because I didn't use the at prefix on my command, the full command is written out to the terminal. Now, there's really nothing new and exciting to see when we've run the init command, so let's try a different command. Let's try plan, which would take our main.tf file and generate and show us an execution plan. In other words, what Terraform will actually do if we were to run the apply command right now. And straight away at this point, we can see that we can't get very far unless we provide a real DigitalOcean API token. So let's do that. And in order to do that, I'm going to need to use the web interface. So I'm just going to give it a name that means something to me. And then I'm going to take a copy of the key that it generates for me. And as I said earlier, there are three ways in which we could use this. And the method that I'm opting for is to create a new file called terraform.tffars. This is the default file name that Terraform is going to look for for our variables. Now it's useful to stick to the default naming convention in this case because it makes our make file commands that little bit easier to work with. So let's see what happens now if we try and rerun the plan command. And we should see that when we do this, we get quite a surprising error. And this is because we're using Docker. It's actually specific to the fact that we're using Docker and it's quite unintuitive as to what's happening here. Inside our main.tf file, we specified that we want to find our public key at the file path of our home directory in the hidden.ssh directory under the key of idrsa.pub. However, because we're using Docker, it's trying to look for that file in the root users directory inside the resulting running container. That's because it's running the commands as root, so it's resolving the path to the root user. And of course, we don't actually have a file in there because there isn't an idrsa pub key at that location inside the container. That's something that we need to tell that container about. And we can do that using a Docker volume. And essentially what we'll do is map that path, that home directory path on our local computer inside the resulting container as being at that slash root path. So with that change in place, we should now be able to run our plan command and see the expected output. And indeed we can, and we see some new interesting information, a lot of which is marked as computed. And that's because we can't determine what these actual values will be until the apply command has been run. For example, we can't tell what IP address we're going to get from DigitalOcean until we actually provision a node. So in other words, these values will become available when the apply command has done its thing. So because the plan output looks good at this point, we know we should be good enough to do an apply. But if we do this, we hit on another issue because we're using Docker and that's because the command ran inside the container, but it expected us to provide some input and it couldn't find that input, so it just died. Now there's a way around this, and that's to provide the dash auto dash approve flag, which is effectively going to just yes, yes, yes to any prompts that are given. That's okay, but there is a slightly better way to do this, and that's if we modify our docker run command to contain the flag of IT for an interactive terminal session, then when we rerun this command, it'll stop and ask us to actually enter a value, which in this case, we need to enter the word yes. Now at this point, we hit on an issue which may or may not bite you, depends on whether you're using DigitalOcean already. So just to clarify what's happening here, I'm asking Terraform to take ownership of the management of my DigitalOcean SSH key, but I already have my SSH key assigned to my account and therefore it can't recreate it because that key is already assigned to my account. So in order to fix this, I need to go into the web UI and delete my existing SSH key in order to let it be managed by Terraform. So now finally, with that last change in place, I should be able to rerun the apply command 
and finally see that we get some new infrastructure created. And we should expect to get two different resources created. The first being that SSH key that I've just been talking about, and the second being the node, or again, in DigitalOcean parlance, a droplet. Now with some cloud providers, I've found that this happens quite quickly, the creation of new droplets or VPSs or whatever you want to call them. DigitalOcean, it takes about 20 to 50 seconds, depending on the data center that you're using. And it doesn't really seem to matter whether you're creating one node or 20 or whatever. It always seems to take about the same amount of time. But given a little patience, you should find that after the command is run, that you've got two new resources, one being that SSH key and the other being a new droplet. And forgive me, I do have to blank some of this out as I have some production stuff in there that I don't really want to share. And unfortunately, at the time of recording at least, Terraform won't work with the concept of projects, so I can't mask off part of my account just for this tutorial purpose. Now, one of the interesting parts of the output from Terraform Apply is that we still see all these computed values. And I mentioned earlier that these values are only available after we've actually applied our execution plan. Now there are various ways to get access to these values, but the quickest way to begin with at least is to look inside the terraform.tf state file, which will have been created for you after you've run and apply. In here, you'll see what all of those computed values resolve to. However, there is a nicer way of doing this and that's to use an output. So we can just add a new entry to our main.tf file with the top level key of output, give it a name. It doesn't have to be the exact value that you want to get out, but I'm just gonna call it IPv4 address anyway, as that is essentially what we're trying to get access to. And then the value that we want to get out of there is from our DigitalOcean droplet.node1, which is the resource name, and then the key that we'd like, which is our IPv4 address. And so when we run the apply now, we're gonna see some additional output dropped out to the terminal, which will be the IP address that we can then use to connect via SSH. And don't worry, the apply command is idempotent. In other words, we can rerun it many times and it's not going to create more and more resources for us each time. If one already exists, then it will just take the existing value and display it to us. So at this point, we've used Terraform to create our first server. And yes, it's taken us about 17 minutes and you could have done it in about 30 seconds from the web UI. But believe me, the time saving gains do add up from here. There's only one thing that's left at this point and that's to destroy the infrastructure that we've just created. We can reuse our make Terraform command and just change from apply to destroy. And you could pass in destroy dash auto dash approve or in our case, we're just gonna get hit by the terminal prompt, which we need to say yes to. That's gonna take about 10, 15 seconds to destroy our resources. In our case, it's gonna destroy two resources, the SSH key that we created and also the node that we created. So both of these should be gone from your web UI after running this command successfully. And it is well worth checking it by hand as well. That's our very basic introduction to Terraform. In the next video, we're gonna take this much further.